this week has been very special to me. Uh, this is the first pastor's week that I have participated in. Uh, I met many old friends and also more new friends here. And thank you, AMBS, for giving me this wonderful opportunity. Ten years ago, when I came back to the U.S. from Seoul, Korea, South Korea, I wanted to come and visit AMBS, where Alan and Eleanor Kreider and Willard Swartley and Wilbur Schenk, John Driver, those are my heroes. So, <laughs> uh, where they reside. <laughs> uh, I really want to visit. Uh, that was my, uh, one of my dreams to visit this campus. But I never thought about preaching here at AMBS Chapel. Uh, preaching to these people, you know, wonderful professors, uh, you know, it's, it's overwhelming, overwhelming. Uh, I never thought about I'm going to preach in front of Jennifer Sansonic, <laughs> the, queen, the queen of preaching. And then the seminary is the last place on earth that I want to stand at the pulpit. You know, you imagine all the professors and theology students, you know, sitting here and criticizing, criticizing my sermon. <laughs> As I did to other pastors. Yeah, I'm going to have a long introduction and short Bible reading. So, so, so. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't have to imagine. This is, they are all here, right? And then, you know, pastors would be the scariest people group that I want to give a sermon to, right? I think a lot of, of you agree with me. And furthermore, preaching after the speakers, such as, you know, Janet Plannert, Megan Good, Greg Boyd, Melinda Berry, Drew Hart spoke. This, this is not good for a person <laughs> <laughs> and who's coming from a shame culture. And this whole through the week, some people told me that, Hyun, I am excited about your sermon on Thursday. And you will wonderfully wrap up whole this week. <laughs> and <laughs> honestly speaking, I'm so sorry to uh, my, my speaker friends. You know, during all the sermons and, and seminars this week, one major thought dominated my mind. What if he or she says first what I want to say? <laughs> <laughs> that very thought occupied my mind. <laughs> and, you know, did I tell you I come from a shame culture? <laughs> I should send no to Jewel. Why did I say yes? I don't know. There's no other answer to explain this situation besides that I, I am crazy. <laughs> this whole week I am meditating how crazy I am. And I realize that there's another uh, crazy person or more than me here. And that is uh, Jewel. (laughs) 
<laughs> Zhu, what were you thinking to ask me to preach today? And I also thought about the people who are sitting here to listen to my sermon. I'm not a great speaker or I'm not a great thinker. And I'm just still struggling with my English. I think you're all crazy. <laughs> right? I am crazy, and Jules crazy, and all of you are crazy. So we are all crazy. Yes? yes. Yeah, that makes me feel much better. <laughs> <laughs> We're all crazy. And I have pondered why I said yes. Whole through the week. Why I said yes. And I realized that I didn't think about my audience when I was invited to come. I didn't think about the audience. Which is very weird. Because I always consider my audience before I made a decision if I accept the call or not. But this time, I had no idea why I did not think about my audience. If I did, I would definitely say no to this invitation. But I, I really didn't think about my audience. So I, I continued to ask myself, why was it so natural for me to not think about my audience? Why? Why was it so natural for me to not think about my audience? And I found out the reason yesterday. It was because I unconsciously considered you as my brothers and sisters. Not professors, not theological students, not great thinkers, and not wonderful speakers. I just trust you as my brothers and sisters. And there's no place for professors, pastors, great thinkers, when we are all gathered together to listen to God. And we are just all brothers and sisters in this community of God. I know that you will listen to me anyway. Not because I am a great speaker, but because you are a listening community. You know how to listen to what others say. You can draw out the best things from me. And also, you will not depend solely on my words as God's words. Because you are a discerning community. Whatever I said, I know extremely. You will disown my words. I know that. You will disown my words in the community. And through the community. It is who we are. You know, this kind of understanding of Mennonite has unconsciously embodied in me. That's why it was very natural. I wasn't like that when I was in the Korean Baptist tradition. That is one of the reasons that I am crazy about Mennonite. <laughs> That's why we all are crazy about Mennonite. Do you agree with me? I know we have a lot of problems. I have, we are struggling. We have division. But, still in my eyes, Mennonites are beautiful. I fall in love with this tradition. That's why I joined this tradition. So listen to me, my beloved sisters and brothers, the community of listening and discernment. I rely on you when I read today's passage. Here I am, and you complete my reading. 
This is my introduction. And I have a short Bible reading. If Acts chapter 2, 4, and 13 describe the ideal image of the early church, the book of Corinthians totally shatters the utopian image of the church. Immorality, fighting, and corruption, and division were seen in this Korean, Corinthian church. Not Korean, Corinthian church. <laughs> this church was having sin issues that non-believers didn't even struggle with. The reality of the uh, messiness and the confusion in the young church surfaces brightly in the book of Corinthians. I joined Menorite Church USA in 2007. I confessed myself as an Anabaptist uh, 25 years ago when I was in Baptist seminary. I briefly learned about uh, Anabaptist history in the class and then and uh, I was very attracted uh, to the history you know, 16th century and a Baptist. But to make a long story short, uh, I went to military service, even though I confess I'm an Anabaptist, because, uh, because of my family thing. And also, I didn't have any support group. That time, I had no supporting community around me. Uh, so, I, so that's why I'm thinking is community is very important for me. If you don't have a community, you can grow by yourself, right? So I agree. And I went to Fuller Seminary, and I didn't know Wilbur Schenk is a Mennonite. Uh, I took one of his class, and it was fascinating. So you know, the reason I went to Fuller is wanting to uh, learn kind of spiritual dynamics from Peter Wagner, Charles Kraft, you know the names, and spiritual warfare. Uh, but after I took World War Shanks class, uh, I changed my major to mission theology. And his teaching impacted me a lot. So I took eight courses of his class since that time, eight classes. I tried to remember, memorize all of his notebooks. He didn't say about she didn't say the word Mennonite in the class, but all the contents are the Mennonite background, Anabaptist background. So I, I really liked his teaching, and it changed my life. And then after I finished my degree, I went back to Korea, and then he introduced me to the Korean Anabaptist Center people. When I was in, before that time, before I went, uh, came here, uh, there was no Korean Anabaptist Center kind of things, but you know, during my studying years, they started the Korean Anabap Center there. So I met Kyung Jung and Jae Young. Have you know, uh, heard about their names? And, and we had a good fellowship. And one day, uh, Tim Frey, the Canadian witness, he was in Korea. He asked me to translate uh, one of Alan Kreider's book, The Worship and Evangelism in Pre-Christendom. It's a short book, but it's really hard to translate it to Korean. <laughs> <laughs> we just finished the second edition. So more people want to read that book. Um, uh, I'm very happy to hear that from, from uh, Boki Kim. He just told me a lot of people, they want to uh, republish this book again. Ten years ago, so we did it. And... Uh, Many people ask me, uh, 
Do you think this kind of church is possible? After they read the book, and then do you think this kind of church is possible? Uh, that was the most frequently asked question for me. And even my friends, they, they cynically you know, told me, if you start this kind of church, we're going to follow you. Uh, that time I was you know, thinking about, you know, I'm going to stay in Baptist tradition, and I'm going to change my neighbors, my uh, fellow ba- Baptist people. But uh, I struggled a lot, and I, you know, I made a lot of pro- trouble with these people. And uh, I talk about peace when I fi- I'm fighting against these people. Is this, so talking about peace and fighting, it doesn't fit uh, well <coughs> for them. So um, I realized it's just, I should, they have their own narrative. They're moving this way. But we might have uh, the alternative way to follow Jesus Christ. This, that's not the only one way. And the Anabaptist tradition is not familiar to these people. So uh, let's start the new narrative, and they will see us, and they might uh, understand what we are saying. So I came back here 2005 and started Korea Mennonite Church in, 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 in California, near Los Angeles area. And we dreamed the wonderful things. Is, you know, we're going to have an ideal community. So we start from you know, house, house church. And we gathered at my house. And then later, two of my church families, uh, they moved into our community. So three houses live together. and worship together and other people's joining. So the worship in my house and then having lunch in in another family's house and Bible study in in the the, the, the other house. So we're using our houses as a church building. So from starting point, it was was very good. We really enjoy our fellowship and then But uh, not long time later, we started to struggle, uh, conflict in the church. What I want to say is, is, you know, when we start, when we, just, you know, when we think about the church, we always dream the the beautiful, wonderful things. It's this utopian uh, view. You know, this is a lot of Korean young. People they thinking about uh, the the community like b r u d e h o f It's the ideal community. If we are Christian, we ha- we have to follow those kind of way, and they dream it. And some of them they started those kind of uh, ministry or church or community, but uh, but easily we felt fail. And I joined Mennonite Church in 2007, and uh, last almost eight years, uh, you know, I told you I dreamed these beautiful things about Mennonites, but it's kind of reality check these days. Uh, uh, you know, homosexuality issues, and I can see the division. I have very good close friends both sides. And they are fighting against. I don't know where I should stand. And here's my close friend. And here's my close friend too. Uh, sometimes the immigrant pastors in, in Pacific Southwest Mennonite Conference, uh, they, when they gather, they ask me to come. And what is your position? And uh, I told them, uh, you know, I have read a lot of scriptures related to poverty issues. Poor people, but I never seen any church division based on that issue. More than a thousand times. God speaks about you know, taking care of the poor. 
I'm not saying it's, you know, you know, homosexuality issues, kind of, you know, uh, gender issues are not important. I'm not saying that. It's important. But uh, I, uh, I know it's really hard to uh, express ourselves in this division. Uh, I don't know if you're experiencing that, but for myself, for me, <laughs> my friends, both sides, very close and very lovely people, And then we cannot get together because of this issue. So, I don't know. Where should I stand? I can see some divisions in the church. Today's passage is about, you know, Corinthian church has many problems, but today's passage is about division. I don't know you learned these passages maybe in, in different perspective, but when I was growing up uh, in Korea, in my church, and most of the Korean churches, they use these uh, verses, especially the latter part. The, you know, you're the, uh, the what, temple of, of God, right? When they speak, when they explain these verses, they said, In the pastors usually said, so don't smoke. Yeah? Your body is, the ho- body is holy, the, the holy temple of God. So don't smoke and don't drink. That's a major teaching. But this passage is related to division of the church. So in this context of church division, Paul uses three illustrations for, for his ad, admonition to the church. First one is field, second one is building, and third one is temple. First, uh, verse 5 to 9, we are God's field. That's what he said, we are God's field. And basically what he said is that the leaders are important. But God causes all things to grow. So we are dependent on God. We worship God as the author of life. And he also says, we are God's building, verse 10 to 15. And Jesus is the foundation. As leaders or, or church members, we are all to build the structure according to this foundation. When I think about this, Jesus is the foundation. I imagine some, you know, the Jesus. Jesus is the the image of invisible God, right? We cannot see God, but He's His visible image here. So Jesus is image of the invisible God. It's incarnation. He became flesh. And we can touch him, we can hear him, we can smell him. So Jesus can be a model, the model of our life. Jesus can be the foundation because we can see that and we can adjust ourselves according to this image. And he also says we are God's building. Uh, we are our temple of God. So he's focusing on presence. The the presence of God is with us. He's walking with us. I'm not going to explain the whole, uh, the the words by words or anything, but this this, uh, attracts me, this concept. It's three things. The field, building, the temple of God. And through this image, God is revealing himself. And first illustration is revealed the God the Father, the author of life. And the second illustration is, is the God the Son, the foundation and the, the image of invisible God, the model of our lifestyle. 
And then third one is talking about the Holy Spirit, God the Spirit. So the Father and the Son and the Spirit, He's explaining and He's giving advice to this culture, uh, to, to the church, when they are struggling with division, with this Trinitarian, Tri-Union God, the God of community. And He's explaining, this, you know, God is the community. God himself is the community. God exists in community. And these Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they are holding this church. Even if you are struggling with this division, even if you are struggling with this you know, false immorality or fighting, but still, the tri-union God, the, the community, They are holding this this church. Uh, When I realized this, uh, what Paul is trying to speak to us, I was weeping. I I wept, wept, wept. Not because of our, our situation, but because of God's abundant grace. He's holding this church, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because God exists in community, <clears throat> excuse me. God takes unity very seriously. Try unity. Church is the community following the image of God who exists in community. If church is the community of God, I think unity should be considered as. Justice. I know that unity can be threatening of power. I know sometimes it happens. And some people who have power, they keep on saying, you know, we need a unity. They're using this word and you know, misuse this word. They use this word for their status quo. But still, but still, we need to rethink about the unity as a justice. You know, Ephesians chapter 2, we we all know that at the end of the history, God will unify everything in Jesus Christ. It's a unity. We're moving toward that direction. So unity is very important. I know you consider unity is important, but I think we can do them more than that. God's restorative restorative justice is related to unity. He tried to be one with us. Right? So unity is very important. Very important. I know homosexuality is is important issue for justice. And racial issues too. All other issues are very important. But unity is as important as this kind of issue, or more. The one thing that I, uh, uh, one thing grabbed my attention when I read this scripture is Paul's, Paul's attitude. You know, he sees the problem, but he's still, he's not, Sarcastic or cynical, the church. He's very, I think he's very positive on the future of this church. He never said about, you know, the hopeless things of this church. He still expects great things from this church. 
I think it's, it's because he knows the God is in control. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they're holding this church as a unity, as a community. Brothers and sisters, this, this is what I want to say. Hold this week. And I was nervous because somebody's going to say that first. <laughs> the Trinitarian God, Tri-Unity God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit holding this church, the Mennonite church, the Church of Christ, So as a follower of Jesus Christ, myself, and then as a follower of Jesus Christ, the m e n o i t e Church, I think we need to give our attention to this triunion God and what God is doing in this church. And then keep our mind, focusing our uh, mind into <clears throat> unity as justice. Uh, this is what I want to share with you.